Hey, everybody, this is Winter, and welcome to the Shift Spotlight. Today, we're here with Cash Miller, and you are the CEO founder of Titan Digital and can be found at titandigital.com, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. So first of all, we got to talk about your name, Cash. It looks like you're from <laughs> Tennessee, too. Does it have anything to do with Johnny Cash? No, and I wasn't born in Tennessee. I've lived here over a decade, but and I really love Johnny Cash. The music's great and such, but I'm actually named after a movie character. Oh, gotcha. It's a great name. Cash. Solid. Yeah. Um, Cash Miller. Super solid. So I did some research on you and I do not impress easily. Um, I will tell you that, especially when it comes to marketing, because I studied marketing at Florida State back when their football team was good. And, and <laughs> the marketing that I studied was so long ago that I remember my first job, I was the um, I was the public relations assistant at the Miami Art Museum. And we would type you know, press releases to go out on our new exhibitions coming up. And we had a big printer and we printed them all out and I stuffed envelopes for a living. Like that was my first job. That's how we got <laughs> the media out. That's how, you know, old I am, right? Um, so, you know, obviously a lot has changed in the marketing world. That's sort of your domain. So at a high level, why don't you tell us what you do? Well, at a high level, we're a full service agency. Um, we cover everything. Full service digital. marketing agency. Yeah, marketing agency, but primarily focused on digital, you know, related areas. So, you know, we build a lot of websites. As a company, we manage over six hundred. Um, you know, we also do a lot of ads. You know, paid ads and stuff. Google, uh, Facebook, what's known as programmatic advertising, which is like display streaming ads, audio ads that you can do on different like website and app platforms. And so we okay. do a lot of that. Plus, we're um, big into email marketing, uh, SEO, of course, is a primary service. So like a lot of agencies, we're, you know, full service and can encompass, you know, or combine these services into multiple types of strategies and stuff. And we do it because of the different types. You know, when you deal with a lot of um, different businesses, you know, not every service or like strategy you could use is going to be suitable. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we want to be able to tailor those strategies to the business and the needs and what their goals are. Okay, so um, let's get to it. You know the um, the what what how, what are your feelings about like the the Frank Hearn, Russell Brunson? You know the the put them in the funnel, the email marketing drip campaign, the the you know I've only got three seats open and you'll be you know. I kind of feel like that's just gotten so played out that it, it just doesn't work anymore. I mean, what 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 are you seeing in the agency world with that? Well, funnels don't work for everybody. That's the thing. In certain types of businesses, you know, when like back in the day when I first, I've been doing this since like 2007 when I started learning. And back then you saw a lot of informational products and stuff and they would do similar strategies. You'd have, you know, you'd, you know, drive traffic to some sort of landing page or whatnot. And they'd have the longest sales pages you ever saw. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like endless and in multiple spots, you know, through that sales page, you'd have a buy now, you know, sort of button, you know, whatnot. And it would be some sort of digital download or, you know, something they'll ship you, whatever it might be. You know, and the funnel type deal kind of, you know, harkens back to those days. You know, you're trying to everything is like drive all the traffic, you know, so you start at the top and you work your way down and you've got all these multiple offers. And for a lot of businesses, it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, right. is is it's not. People like to make it like it's a one size fit all. Like I always love the term marketing automation. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. What is marketing automation? It's email marketing that's right. scheduled out. That's all it right. is. You right. Know? It's your CRM doing its job, people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they make it like it's some like, you know, super method or something, you know, like when HubSpot came along and they said, hey, we're going to do all this content. And then it's, you know, we put together marketing automation and I say it's just glorified email marketing. It's set to a schedule and that's all it is. And funnels are similar. You know, like you've got, you know, you're going to use social media or something. You're going to drive a lot of traffic, you know, to it. You're going to see about maybe just collecting email addresses and stuff, get them in that, you know, that next level. And then from there, you're going to start using things like, you know, like email marketing to continue to drip on them until eventually they buy and stuff. And for a bunch of businesses, depending on what you do, that can be a good thing. You know, if you're a business coach or something, those kind of methods can work really well. But yes, they're all over the place. You know, just like I say, back in the day, really long sales pages, you know, to sell something, that's what everybody was doing. And so, you know, it's 
it's still effective, but yes, it's overdone and it doesn't, they sell it like it's right for everybody when it's not. Right, right. And especially in a lot of the business world, it's just not. Um, you know, with with Dan Kennedy, I used to study his stuff a long time ago, like mm-hmm. in the luxury marketing realm. And um, you know, I was a I was a member of Infusionsoft and we called it Confusionsoft, you know, because yeah. it was the only thing out there. It was the only thing out there at the time. And I remember I put together this program and it was like built on WordPress, but then, you know, attached to Confusionsoft. And then you had this huh. plugin, you know, managed through EverWeb. Webinar and you know now all the solutions have changed. So, um, you know a lot of CEOs and business owners because that's who our demographic is. Like, look, they don't want anything to do with marketing. They hate marketing. It's hard to measure. They 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 don't like it. They confuse marketing and sales. They think one and two are the same. Yeah. Um, but you know we believe at what we do at the Shift Spot because we're about like coaching CEOs of. We believe that even though you might have a team that does it, even though you might have an agency that does it, you still need to know what they're doing so that you can say like whether this is a good directive or not. So like, you know, in in the business world, what does a CEO or business owner need to know about marketing? Like, what do they actually need to know? They don't need to know how to work confusions often, the CRM side of it, right? But what do they need to know? Well, start with what you just mentioned. You know, you've got marketing and sales are two different functions. You know, marketing is all it's driving leads, it's brand awareness, stuff like that. But sales is about closing the deals, you know, so they're they work hand in hand, but they are not, you know, they're not the same role. You know, so you have to separate the two out for one. Mm Yeah, because I say marketing is it's if you go back to the funnels, marketing is a lot of the top funnel stuff. Its job is to drive leads, brand awareness you know, sales and stuff. Cause you know, I say if it was a consumer product and you go into the store and you buy more, but they're running a lot of advertising and you can tie it back to that, you know, then, okay, that's what marketing does. But if you have to get a sales side involved, you know, you're a business, a service company or something, and you need leads. Well, somebody actually has to contact, you know, that business homeowner, whoever it is, whatever you're trying to sell, you know, and you've got to do something on that. That's a different function. And you have to start, you know, by understanding that you shouldn't really be mixing the two. They need to be complementary of each other. They need to work together because on the marketing side, you could be doing a ton of marketing. You could, you know, any number of things, but you can also do a lot of things wrong. So for example, the sales could have a certain type of, you know, client customer that they work really well with. And they know that they can close those deals a lot easier. And marketing is going after a totally different, you know, person, demographic or whatever, that's making it harder. And if they don't communicate, you know, they need to work together on that to, with sales saying, these are the ones that are my best opportunities that I give. I have the highest chance of doing something with. Get me more of these people. And then marketing can say, well, those are also going to be the toughest people for us to get, you know, and they can maybe right. find a middle ground, you know. Um, right. You know, there's a number of different industries that are like that. But you, you've first got to separate the two and understand and then figure out how they should be working together, assuming you've got both ends. Right, right. So where do businesses fail in marketing? I mean, obviously picking the wrong, you know, medium for their particular business. But let's just pick an example, like service-based businesses. Where, where, give us one area where service-based businesses tend to fail. I mean, we see what coaches do. I mean, you can't go on Facebook or LinkedIn and not see what a coach does. But for a business, yeah. they fail the most. The, the biggest area of failure for any business, regardless of type, is commitment to it. Okay. Mm. Marketing is about data. And if you don't give the, the marketing people a, a chance to do their job and accumulate, I see a lot of times businesses give up too early before you've had a chance to make adjustments and stuff. You know, when we run Google ads or Facebook or something else, we've got to be able to get back data, you know, and, right. you know, which goes back to marketing dollars and stuff. So you could have a budget that's not large enough for us to do something with and get enough. We have to be able to make adjustments. And if we don't have enough data, what are we adjusting off of? You know, so mm-hmm. we'll, we start with a knowledge base of what the target is and how we think we can reach that target. But from mm-hmm. there, we have to make tweaks to see what they'll interact with best. You know, and as you drill it down, you start to make improvements. But that takes time to do that. And so if they don't allow that time or give enough of a budget for it, then they expect the, you know, to, you know, us to, you know, a marketer to hit a home run on it you're probably not going to get it because, you know, like I say, you didn't have enough to work with and you weren't given the proper time to actually make those adjustments because marketing 
especially in the digital world, is about incremental adjustments. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was I'm in luxury and real estate. That was my like former career for a gazillion years. And I used to tell people it's you know, it's not uh, a sales role. It's a marketing role. And it's like a piece of clay. You know, when I'm selling your house, it's like a piece of clay and, you know, we're going to mold it a little bit, but then you're going to have to twist it here. You don't just throw it on the market and wait for it to sell. You're going to have to take that mm -hmm. feedback and adjust and mold. And then at the end, yeah. you're going to have a beautiful clay pot. That's how it's going to get sold. But, you know, there's so many people just think, you know, here's the message. I put it out where are the results and, and it is one of those things. I don't care yeah. what yeah. it is that you do if you. If you do it every single day, if you're just sending out 10 emails a day personally to people and you do it long enough, you're going to get some return on it. But the problem is, is people will send 10 emails a day for two weeks. They get bored. They stop. They get nothing. Yeah. You know, you just you've got to stick with it. Yeah, no, that's that's actually a really good example, because if you take email marketing you know, or if you're sending cold emails or something you know, individually, you know, if you take the same email and say you're going to take your group and you. You know, I have 100 email addresses that I could send to. I'm going to divide it up. I'm going to do this over 10 days. And I'm going to send to 10 people per day. I'm going to send them the exact same email. Okay. But each day I'm going to make adjustments to it. So the first 10, I send an email. I get one open out of 10. Right. And then I say, okay, why didn't they open? Well, my first thing I'm going to do is adjust my subject line. Okay. So now I make adjustments to my subject line and I send to another group of people on the second day. Now I get five people that opened it up because I made my, you know, that tweak and I said, okay, now I'm up to a 50% open rate. Now I can start saying, okay, how many people actually took an action? And then I started adjusting, you know, internally, you know, where my buttons are positioned, the imagery I've used, the text I've used, all of those things. As I go down, the, you know, that whole list. Now I get to the end of my 100 now I've got an open rate of like 60%, you know, on that same email because I kept testing on different groups and I've got a click through rate that's maybe, you know, 40% or 50% or something. Well, now I take a bigger group and I send that finished email you know, to a thousand people because now I know that it's got a much higher response rate. You know, that's what you have to be able to do in marketing. You know, you mm -hmm. have to, use, you know, that's why we do things like split testing and stuff, run two ads against you know, each other, see which one, you know, performs better. You know, and then drop the loser, put another ad in there. It's not that you go with the winner permanently. It's that you create another ad to, to compete against it because you're constantly trying to better, it, you know, whatever the winner is. So that's what you have to be able to do. But if I took and I sent to 100 people over 10 days, I need 10 days to do it. You right. know, 10 people per day. I got to have 10 days. You don't give me 10 days. I can't do the test right. Right, right, right. Everybody talks about warming up a list, warming up a list, warming up a list, you know, how do you warm up a list? That's uh, that comes in multiple facets. Um, typically, you know, if you're warming up a list, the thing to first consider is where you're sending from the, you know, the email address you're actually using, you know, because if you're using a cold domain, something that's never been registered and you, you registered it two days ago, you know, that's going to be, you know, your first issue. You're starting with a brand new email address. The, the email systems aren't used to receiving it, you know, mm -hmm. in which case if they don't recognize it, they've never seen it before. So and there's so many addresses that have been used for spam and stuff, you know, and it's not that yours ever has, but the systems are trained to recognize stuff that comes out of the blue. So what you want to do when you're warming up is back to segmenting. You want to say, I'm going to send so many this day and I'm going to send the next day a few more and a few more and a few more, because what you're trying to do is get those boxes to accept the email and you know so you, you would test if it's going to be a newsletter if it's going to be a cold email you do the same thing you know because you're starting with a brand new email address you know as the from typically the system's not going to recognize it so you got to warm it up you do that by adding in a few more people each day you also space them out don't send them all you know 10 people or 100 people you know in the, like all in the uh, same 5 minutes you want to spread them out over an hour and such, mm -hmm. Even if they're getting the same message, they're going to go to different boxes, you know, and you got to scale it over time. It can take you, you know, just to get to 200 email addresses that you can send successfully in a day. You know, you could spend a week or two doing it, you know, just to get it, you know, to ramp it up over time. But that's what you got to do. You have to warm it up because the systems aren't used to receiving. The assumption is it's spam as far as they're concerned, especially if you go if you go send a thousand emails right out the gate you're going to get blacklisted right out the gate. You, it, yeah. it will take minutes and you'll be on it. You'll never get anything through. 
Yeah. And you, you yeah. can damage Especially the domain's that. yeah, you can damage the domain's reputation at the same time when you do that. Right, right. So how does the CEO or business owner look for a marketing agency? Like what are the characteristics? Because you can Google, right? There's a thousand quadrillion bazillion, you know, and they're all using the buzzwords or doing di direct marketing and they're doing this and that and automation. And you know, you can sit there and interview hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a day. Like, how do you know as a business owner or CEO, these are the characteristics the right marketing agency needs to have? Well, so there's a couple of things that you would look for, um, you know, because there's a lot of people that have entered the field for one, and they all say that they're marketers and whatnot. So one of the things to look for is experience. You know, anybody can put together a decent looking website. Okay. You want to start checking into the background. If you can look at LinkedIn profiles and things like that, you know, if you're going to contact them before you talk to them, do a little bit of background research and see how long they've been doing it, the principles and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, if you look at me, I've been agency owner since 2011, I've been doing it, you know, this, uh, been in the field for longer. So you want to find somebody that's got experience. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to be a big agency. They need to have the experience behind them. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people, they don't take the time to do things like look on LinkedIn and whatnot, which will have a lot of that background, you know, and just see what they've been doing. Even if they've got experience, it doesn't mean they, they have to be an agency owner for, you know, for a decade or something like that. You want to see that they're in the field though, for that, you right. know, for that kind of time. You know, whether they worked for another agency, maybe they owned another agency, th those kinds of things. And then, you know, from there, you want to see, you know, what does it look like from a client side? What have they, who have they been working with? You know, because like, I'll tell you, like, for, for example, like we're not big on uh, e-commerce marketing and stuff. You know, that's a right. different, it's a different, you know, realm. And so yeah. I can build e-commerce sites all day long. We're really good at it, but I'm not big on marketing $10 widgets and stuff like that. So, you know, typically when we take on anything e-commerce, it's usually high-end products. Um, you know, so you have to consider that. What fields have they been typically working for? You know, if there are specifics to it, what kind of experience do they have? If you're talking to them, ask them about the industries they've worked with. Yeah, you know, because right. that's going to that's gonna help them a lot to understand, is it a fit? Because And get their honest, like, get multiple opinions. Don't look at pricing so much. OK, yeah. look for what they're telling you. OK, mm -hmm. do they get depth? So if I interviewed three agency owners and I would say, OK, how would you approach this? You know, what makes sense to you? Because when I approach somebody and I'm talking to them, I want to make sure that whatever it is that we're providing, the strategy is a fit for the business. And there's certain things. And I'm going to look at the budget. I'm going to say, how much do you have to work with? OK, well, the, you know, the budget's going to be a consideration because. I'm going to, you know, even if I could offer you every service that I have, I'm not necessarily going to put them in, you know, I'm going to have an order to this. You know, for yeah. example, like if you're not going to drive leads on social media, but you're a large company, I would say, you know, yes, yeah, social media might be the way to go, but it's your fourth option. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fourth on the list of things you might add into the, to the mix. It's not your first. So you want to look right. at what they're recommending and also the order that they're recommending. If you're going to go with multiple strategies. You know, like I say, or multiple, I guess, ways to go about it. You know, I could be like a lead generate, you know, a company that needs leads might be SEO and pay per click, you know, because I need inbound stuff versus right. if they tell you social media is not going to be a fit. So you want to be looking at those kinds of things. What are they, um, what are they actually recommending and then compare? So if you talk to three of them, compare them, you'll get a good feel of whether they actually know what they're talking about by having an in depth conversation. Because remember, if you're hiring a marketing agency, you know, it's a bit of a marriage, you know, and it, it can't, it can't end in divorce. So the more, more work you end up on the front end doing, um, the more likely it is to be, you know, to work out well. Yeah. And I used to tell, you know, people that when I'd go on appointments, it'd be like, you know, Google me and, and Google the person you're working with. Cause how they're out there is how you're going to be out there. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things I loved about your website was you, you talked about industry specific and I don't think a lot of marketers do that. They're like, hey, look, you know, I'll work with purple widgets and green widgets and blue widgets and yellow widgets. And you're like, look, these are industries. These are our specialty. And so I I, um, I thought it was really clean. I thought it was simple. That's why I say I, I don't impress easily, but I, I liked what you did there. Um, and so oh, yeah. it looks like 
Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we have more experience in certain things. So we want to highlight that. Yes, there's other industries that can work with, but there's ones that we have in-depth experience. And mm -hmm. to me, you know, that makes us a, a really good fit for those particular areas because they should understand your area. And that would show through. We worked a, we've worked a lot with insurance agencies over the years, and I can practically speak their lingo. You know, right. they, you know, I'll know what they're talking about if they're, you know, when they're talking policies and stuff like that, you know, even though I've never sold insurance. Right, right, right. Um, so, you know, you've got this clean, cohesive website. You obviously know what you're talking about, but you didn't start out that way. You fumbled along the way in building this business, just like every CEO and business owner has before. So tell us like one thing you really screwed up on your journey along the way that you course corrected um, that, you know, you can prevent uh, other CEOs and business owners from experiencing? Yeah. You know, okay. So it, it really depends on the business, but I think one of the areas, um, we have a number of our staffers in Costa Rica and such, and it's very common in our business uh, to have people that are not necessarily in the United States. Okay. Except that, so if I was to say a fumble for one, it should be that I should have done it way earlier. You know, because um, you want to be flexible in your business. You want to be able to, you need to, I think as a business owner, be willing to embrace other things, mm -hmm. you know, like other ways of getting it done, you know, that right. allow you to scale. It's a way that allows us to scale, but I waited way too long to do it. You know, mm -hmm. it's the thing. And, you know, so you, you have to consider those. Now, half of our staff is down there, right? But that's only happened for us over the last couple of years. And- mm -hmm. You know, whereas I've seen other companies that embraced it a lot earlier, you know, in their histories and stuff than we did. And I think you have to, you know, so embracing that kind of thing. And internally, it's a very hard thing to do okay? Mm -hmm. because people become entrenched. They don't like change. And, and if you want to do that kind of thing, you know, honestly, they think you're outsourcing their jobs and all sorts of things, whereas they're actually, you know, they're all team members that I've hired. But right. You know, so that is like one of those hardest things. I wish I would have done it a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad I did it finally. But also, you know, know that anytime you shake things up, you know, for the rest of everybody else, like you can understand your own mission and why you're doing it and everything. But I think the other thing is, is don't, it, don't worry about so much all the other people that work for your organization. Yeah. Because, you want people to embrace it. And if they don't, they don't. Okay. But understand right. that maybe they're not right for your organization if they don't embrace, you know, because it's still your vision at the end of the day, you're the one that, you know, 20 years down the road, you'll be the one person that's still there. And all those people that might've been, you know, giving you pushback to that are probably gone. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, keep that in mind, you know, like I say, if you really think it's something that will work and you believe in it, you're the one that's still going to be there if it works out or if it doesn't, you know, you're going to, well, and it's just, you know. it's like what we talk about because we are a CEO coaching and peer advisory community specifically for business owners and CEOs. Cause we kind of find at the top, you're the only one up there. Right. And you can't yeah. go to your employees and say, Hey, I suck. And you can't, you know, talk to your employees about the things <laughs> not working in your business. So get with a bunch of peers and get with a bunch of experts. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what we do. And like one of the things that you mentioned that, you know, we really see a lot of is, the visionary wants to make a change and then they implement it and it, and it starts to, you know, roll just like a marketing campaign, let's call it. And then there gets pushback and there gets whatever. And then the visionary changes again because of the pushback yeah. and then because of it, just like you're changing the marketing too quick before it got traction. And then, you know, what ends up happening is the whole thing kind of crumbles. You've got to stay really convicted. You've got to give it time, yes. you know, and it looks like you've got like a, a healthy staff, right? You've got like 40 employees. Yeah, we've got just over 30 and stuff right now, and we've been continuously growing it. So, yeah, and and making those kinds of changes have, have allowed us to grow because um, marketing agencies have this like um, unfortunate conundrum that happens is. You, get, you need to take on more clients. You need the work because you want to get the revenue and all of that. But at the same time, the work itself can be very time consuming and you can end up running into a bunch of, uh, you know, difficulties along the way. You know, like I say, we manage a lot of websites. If a website goes down, it can, you know, you've got to deal with that, you know, website because you have a client, their business is reliant. So you might have to drop something else you're doing, in which case right. you need 
you've got to have enough staffers to be able to take care of something. And so that was a, that's always a push pull that agencies run into is I need more people, but I can't take them on because I need more, I need more revenue to be able to do that. You know, because this is an ex, you know, a field where it's fairly expensive to run, a, you know, such a business, you know, from a payroll standpoint and everything. Right. So you've got to be able to balance these things. And, you know, that's always the issue. So most businesses have some sort of issue like that. It's like, you know, I can either get more staff and I can get creative about it or everybody can keep working their asses off and I can't get you more staff, you know, because I still need, you know, I need more revenue to be able to do it. You know, so I say you run into those kinds of situations and that's what we ran into. So the I tough decisions to... of being an owner of your company. I mean, it's yeah. especially in uncertain times, right? Because people are pulling their purse strings back right now and people are, they're thinking four or five, six times about what to invest in. Um, they're yeah. they're picking up that package of meat at the grocery store and they're saying, how much do I really need this? You know, and uh, putting it back down because the, everything's just a little uncertain right now. So yeah. how does that affect, um, you know, your business and what you do? Um, well, it's actually been pretty stable on that end and such, but the, yeah, as far as, you know, cause it's like counterintuitive companies will pull back on marketing. And when, when COVID first hit, we did see that, you know, cause people started freezing things, you know, they were like, Hey, we need to display out and stuff. The economy right now has been, you know, less of a detriment, um, you know, across the board. You know, as far as how many people like they're still spending and everything, because the economy itself has been, you know, relatively okay. What we're paying when we go grocery shopping is a different story. But as far as everybody, you know, hiring has been good. There's not a ton of layoffs and things, you know, so it's just it's so it's been a weird thing. But we haven't seen yeah. a ton of turmoil, you know, from a client side. But you still end up with, you know, there is uncertainty, you know. And so every it's like I've seen it with everybody in the back of their mind. You know, it's but it's it is against what you should be doing to cut back on marketing, because if you cut back on marketing, you will end up cutting back on your sales if it's producing. If it's not producing, that's a different story. But if it is and it's measurable and you can see that it is actually working. Well, guess what happens when you cut it off? You know, because you're yeah. going to see your sales tank, you know, to go with it. Well, and I always say, like, when everybody's I always ran against the grain and marketing. And I pissed a lot of people off along the way. I mean, I got to tell you, um, like I I've done some awesome, awesome things. And what I've done just to be <laughs> really shock and awe, just to be really different. Right. And, um, and, uh, you know, I used to always tell people when, when everybody, all the other companies will pull back and stop marketing, that's when you double down. Yeah. You know, and every time you go against the grain, I've personally found that's when, you know, there's some boom that happens on the other side of, of running to it instead yeah. of running away from it. So like, you know, at a concert when there's like lines everywhere, like I can always find the pocket doo -doo 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 -doo, and I just run yeah. into that little line. And that's how I am with marketing. Like when everybody's doing something else, I'm like, there's an opportunity here. What's the opportunity? Right. And it, and it really does come down to marketing. Like I had this one postcard where it was like, oh, it was, it was an, it was an email campaign and it was a, uh, you know, it was a 12 week drip campaign. And at the, the last, last email was when you're ready to get off the pot. And that was a subject line. <laughs> and the, the, the subject was like, look, I've been trying to teach you the benefits of buying a home in this market. And when you're ready to get off the pot, give me a call. And I would get so many people calling me. I can't believe this Well, tell me about your home needs. And it would yeah. absolutely turn into a sale. So, you know, it's, it's but like, I always like to be really fun in the market. My partner does not like it as much. He's more <laughs> like stick to the books. But um, I, I think that fun, like shift spot is about making shifts in your business and life. But like, I yeah. like to say yeah. things like, shift happens, we can help. And I don't really give a shift and, you know, stuff like that. Right. Just to <laughs> well, I, always, I tell people it's like, I got out of the military in 2011 and I started a marketing agency with just myself in the middle of a recession. I mean, if you can survive that, you know, that's why I'm not as worried about the current, you know, situation, you know, when you the know, internet wasn't and that, that cool in 2011, even right. Like it's cool yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So curious, where do you see yourself investing resources for growth over the next year? Well, things like podcasts, for one, that's one of the things that we're, you know, we're getting into. Um, but resources. So, you know, in the case of uh, since we're a marketing agency, we're actually 
investing into uh, virtual assistants and such, not to hire them, but to offer them. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people that need marketing assistance and whatnot. And we're a marketing agency, so who better to train them? Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to do that kind of work because there's a lot of people you end up with a lot of uh, especially you know whenever you have an economy that can be uh, a little misunderstood or whatever you know you end up with a lot of people that go into business for themselves you know they're mm -hmm. finally tired of working for somebody a corporate job or whatever and they want to be able to have you know that uh, ability to have some freedom but they're still right. going to need help and we're in it it's the interesting thing because what what we've got that's really different than it was a decade ago is there's so many opportunities to hire contractors and things like that to help in your business without bringing on full-time employees. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, a really big difference than compared to how we used to do things, you know, especially with hybrid work where, you know, you don't have to be in an office, all of those things. It's a, uh, you know, it's an amazing shift. So for us, investing resources means, you know, seeing about taking advantage of some of those things and helping other businesses be able to do some, because some of them don't have the budgets to, you know, necessarily do large scale campaigns, but there's a number of things they can do. They want direct help, you know, to yeah. be able to do it. You know, and like I say, because it could be a block of time for 20 hours a month or something, you know, because think about, you know, in the day, you know, you'd bring on an intern or something, you know, you'd hire somebody to help, you know, do something, you know, along those lines. And it was always marketing. Hey, can you do, you know, my social media posts or whatever, you know, so we're seeing that kind of thing and expanding our staff um, to be able to kind of meet those, you know, those needs and such. And we've been partnering with some, you know, some other agencies and such on projects and whatnot, you know, because there's like, say some, sometimes we run into people because we're full service that they can't necessarily handle everything, but they've got a good opportunity in front of them that they don't want to pass on. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you can do from an agency standpoint. And then there's just lots of opportunities from a, you know, for businesses in general with things, you know, it just depends. I've, we worked with a number of companies that they've been expanding things the way they're doing it because, you know, um, you know, especially for the past, I don't know, eight, 10 years though, we pay subscriptions for everything. You know, it seems like, and I've seen a number of companies that you wouldn't think that, you know, would put together a subscription service starting to do so. You know, yeah. Which, you know, Hey, I have a marketing idea for you right now. Are you open to it? Sure. <laughs> Well, you know, fractional, fractional, fractional. It's like everything's being talked well, about. A fractional COO and a fractional, uh -huh. like a fractional marketing agency, you know? I've, I've talked to a few people. Like, yeah. Like, 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 because like, you know, in our world, we do with fractional COOs and fractional CEOs, like a fractional FMA. You know? well, <laughs> there's I've actually, officers out there, yeah. but you know, there's not chief marketing agencies doing this. So um I don't know. I had a boss one time say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I always thought it was like the weirdest saying, but it like <laughs> stuck with me. It was like, put that in your pipe and smoke it. And like, ever since then, I, I find myself saying that, even though it was like the weirdest statement. Um, but I don't know. What do you think about that idea? Well, I've run into probably half a dozen people over the last few months that are doing, um, that are doing exactly that. They're actually getting away from the agency, you know, side of things, but they're becoming fractional CMOs. You yeah. know, and saying, hey, I'll be your chief marketing officer for 20 hours a month and I'll help you put together your campaign. Somebody else will execute. Right. You know, they'll, they'll actually take care of the work, but I'll help you understand, you know, let's say understand your business, figure out, you know, what it is, is that's going to work from the marketing standpoint. You hire me directly for that amount of time. And, you know, they're able to take on a limited number of clients and stuff, you know, right. but they can have, you know, five to 10 of them or something, depending on how many hours they're spending with each one. And it makes sense because, yeah, fractional CFOs have been around for you know a, a, quite a few years now. And that seems to be a model that works because some positions like that, you you get a high level of expertise, you know, but you don't have to pay the full salary because you don't even need them full time. You know? Right. So, And that's what my partner, you know, he built his business on and, and he's sort of the domain expert for the shift spot. But he's been a fractional CEO and a fractional COO for almost 35 years. And he goes yeah, into companies, yeah. he finds all their problems, he fixes them, you know, and now we're just trying to reach more people through the community and, yeah. you know, reach more like CEOs and business owners, like in a in a way that works for them, because a lot of times with consultants, the CEO can't commit to the time needed to make real change, right? So um, we kind of do it in an online community where people then can hear well, the information as they see fit. Well, if you need a fractional CMO, then <laughs> yeah, for the online community, you know, I say, you know, I might be open to some ideas. 
Um, oh, well, there you go. Look at look at what could just come out of a, a little conversation. Yeah. Um, you, okay, so if people wanted to reach you, what would be um, the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, for one, you can go to titandigital.com, of course, and, you know, that's our main website and everything. But I can be reached at cash at titandigital.com. Uh, and you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm actually one of the easier ones to find because I don't need any numbers and such, you know, because mine's just, you know, Cash Miller, if you just look me up, because there's only so many people with my name and LinkedIn was kind enough to actually give me the forward slash Cash Miller. And nice. I don't have any numbers or anything on my name. And it's just so it's like rare. You, see, you, know, you end up yeah. tagged with something at the end, right? And then nobody can remember yeah. it. So well, I'm and, and I'm the same way because there may be four seasons, but there is only one winter and there is <laughs> zero winter beservas out there um yeah, yeah. literally that is a latin last name um and it will soon be paskins because i'm getting married in uh 16 days but uh, uh there will be zero winter paskins out there so um yeah i like to <laughs> say that it's easy to find me too so i mean it's cash the greatest name ever at a digital uh titan digital.com which i also love that it's short and sweet Titan. I love that word. I love that book, the the tools of Titans that they oh, wrote. Yeah. It was like this, just like a hundred million. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for being here. And um, anything else you want to leave our, our CEOs and business owners with last tip, like a closing tip for them? Well, I say in, in business, know that change happens. You can either embrace it, you know, or you can try to run from it, but it's going to happen regardless. So it's better as a business owner to be in in control of the situation and know that, you know, again, at the end of the day, you're the one person that's always going to be there. Yeah. You know, until that day that you decide to close the doors, you know, and shut things down, you are, you know, your employee number one. And let's like say 20 years down the road, you may not have a single person that was with you the day you started and know that. So you're the one that has to live with any situations that arise and changes that you make, you know, so if they, if they turn out great, you get the reward. If they turn out bad, well, you made a bad decision. Hopefully you can survive it and move on. And the next one will work out. So that's just what it is. That's how business is. And if you can't embrace it, then, you know, you should be doing something else because uh, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. Yeah, for sure. That is, that is for sure. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great being here. Thanks.